Welcome to you today. I'm Paul Pepys, Director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Michael Fakhri, Associate Professor at the University of Oregon School of Law. Professor Fakhri's interests include food policy, third world approaches to international law, international economic law, commercial law, food law, urban farming, Mideast trade, development in the Mideast, imperialism and globalization. His research focuses on the right to food and agroecology. Fakhri leads, co-leads the Food Resiliency Project in the U of O's Environmental and Natural Resource Program. His monograph, Sugar and the Making of International Trade Law, was published by Cambridge University Press in 2014. His co-edited volume, Bandung, Global History and International Law, Critical Pasts and Pending Futures, was published in 2018. In March 2020, he was appointed Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food by the United Nations Human Rights Council and began his four-year term on May 1st, 2020. Thanks, Michael, for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Paul. So first, let's uh, begin. Um, tell us a little bit about your background. Well, I've been in Oregon for about 10 years, um, but I'm originally from Lebanon. And in Oregon, I always have to say Lebanon, the country, not the town. And like many Lebanese families, uh, we migrated a lot. So I've bounced around my whole life, uh, grew up mostly actually in Saudi Arabia, then went back to Lebanon, um, then did my uh, post-secondary education in Canada and my legal training was in Canada. So I was a lawyer in Canada for a while. And then I needed a job. I went to grad school and then I needed a job and like uh, a good immigrant, I applied everywhere in the world. And the beauty of international law is everyone teaches international law and more and more people teach international law in English. And this was in 2009 when I was on the job market. So that was an economic crisis at the time. It's almost, almost funny to think of that was a big crisis compared to where we are now. And uh, there were very few jobs in Canada at the time. Um, so I applied wide and, and large and Oregon was one of the offers. And when I came and checked out the place, it was lovely and I stuck around and I've been here since. So you've just emphasized your uh, expertise in international law. So first, what what drew you to the law as, as a field of study, and in particular, international law and the right to food, food law? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to give you the most honest answer, which is, uh, you know, I applied to law school at a time in Ontario, Canada, when law school was still affordable. It's not really affordable these days. And I was a biology major at the time. I thought I wanted to be an ecologist. And... I was young, ambitious, and lost. And I think that's a common path that leads to law school. Um, I thought about medical school and very quickly thought, it's just not for me. The life of a scientist just didn't, I just couldn't imagine. The life of the laboratory, I thought ecology would be in the field, which is true, but a lot of the work is the lab. And I needed a more social element. Uh, um, and so people kept telling me, oh, you should go to law school which I understand now is code for you're really loudmouthed and just say stuff with authority, get out of our face and go to law school. And um, so I went to law school and, you know, it was weird. I had only lived in Canada at the time for only three years. So I went to law school kind of more or less like as an immigrant with no sense of a country and being a migrant, I'm always bouncing around. So the idea of a national law made no sense to me. Constitutional law was a bizarre idea. International law was my norm, right? The idea of borders and boundaries and movement and navigating all of that. I'm like, well, that's my that's my day to day. That's my understanding. So I, I was. It's a very idiosyncratic way. I think most people come to law school with a more national sense. Um, and I came in sort of and I, and and I always remained ambivalent to law. I think just uh, as a result, always a bit of an outsider. Um, which is not a surprise why I ended up an academic. I think that critical distance lends itself that way. So um, how did you come to be interested in, in food law and, and, um, and the study of food security and insecurity and sovereignty, et cetera? Yeah, I started off my, my initial uh, specialization was international trade law. Um, so I was a law student in the late 90s. So this is during the big global justice movements that are happening the protests against the WTO in Seattle in 1999, amongst other protests that were happening. And I was a student activist and sort of kind of loosely involved with some student organizing around um, Seattle in 1999 and WTO. And then it occurred to me, I need to know more about what the WTO, what the World Trade Organization is and what trade law is really about. 
and just really enjoyed trade. So as a commercial, there's an element of everyday life that's involved. Where we're, we, the stuff we buy and use every day is, is imported and exported. And then um, worked as a lawyer, but worked as all different types of uh, lawyers. I was a commercial transactions lawyer. I was a mental health lawyer doing mostly social justice litigation, but then um, focused on trade law. And then in, when I had to decide for my PhD, what do I want to focus on? I wanted to understand the origins of the WTO. Why is it that we created a multilateral institution? Because we can buy and sell stuff without law. We can buy and sell stuff internationally without a giant international institution. Why did people think that this was an important idea? And I knew it was gonna be historical for me that the answer of why is often a historical question. And, and then I, and I, I suspected there's a story of imperialism, colonization of, of goods. So I thought, you know, I should pick a commodity and I should pick something probably agriculturally oriented. I suspect that's where it is. And snooping around, sure enough, sugar was the story that allowed me to tell the institutional story from around 1870 up until today. And, and, but the other way I picked the topic is I thought, you know, for a PhD, you're stuck with this, this topic for years. You might as well have a good time while you're at it. And I thought, you know, and, it, and my friends growing up and my friends from high school, they're still good friends of mine. And some of my friends from high school in Beirut, one of them lives here in Eugene, Oregon, funnily enough. But I, met, I thought, okay, they're all poets and writers and filmmakers and artists. And I thought, okay, I need to imagine myself as a writer, albeit a really odd genre, academic writing, more like that's more like pulpy, I would say, you know, bad prose, small audience. Um, but okay, and write what you know. Well, when I call home and I call my friends before I say, you know, how are you doing? It's what did you eat and how did you make it? And I just love, like, just that's the pleasure of my life and most people's life. And there's an everyday element. So I thought focusing on food also would ground me. So if someone asks me, you know, what are you doing in your PhD? Anyone, you know, I shouldn't, I, if I say, you know, theories of imperialism, imperialism and capitalism, how ridiculous is that? But if I say I focus on food, I focus on sugar or wheat or whatever, that leads to a conversation, a real human interaction. And, and it's, it, so it's, you know, that pleasure, it's that everyday element. And then while I was doing my PhD, there was a food crisis. This is 2007, right before the financial crisis. The price of food skyrocketed. Hunger just was uh, out of control in the world and just food was on the political agenda. So food just became, uh, um, and it still is. And so that made me realize, okay, I happen to focus on food with trade, but over the years I've shifted where I used to say I'm a trade person who focused on food. Now I'm a food person who has a trade expertise, but amongst others, so I've sort of looking, I've gone more sort of big picture as a result. So tell us about UO's Food Resiliency Project, which you're uh, the co-director of. Yeah, this was a project that was started, I wanna say eight years ago now, maybe seven years ago. And um, it was really student led, this, this great student interest in the law school, but also across the university. I mean, this, it kind of coincided with the rise of our food studies program at the university as well really student driven and students were interested and they were just meeting informally just talking about food and how it's important and, and, and all of that. And it overlapped to some degree with the environmental concerns and the environmental movement, but food does have its own politics and its own dynamics. And, um, and so uh, the Environmental and Natural Resource Center at the law school got funding for a bunch of different projects and one of them was food. And the idea is on resiliency is in light of climate change, we need a food system that can respond to these profound ecological changes we're gonna experience while at the same time, providing people some stability. Some, you need a steady, reliable source of food while you're at it. So what we did, it's, it's, it's a research group. So it's me and a couple of students and it's evolved over time. It first started off more or less like a reading group, educating ourselves about the food sovereignty movement, about right to food, about the different ways to think about food. We would read together and we would do research projects. And it was really, I tried to make it as much of a collective experience where I happened to have more expertise, but the students could lead the research agenda and decide what we should all read together. But over the years now, as we've shifted now towards more public oriented research. So we look for, um, 
people in the community that are committed to biodiversity and social justice. And those two things don't always go hand in hand. And we always ask ourselves, well, what's, what's that even mean internally? And we work with them and we provide public legal research. So what that means is it's research that it can't be legal advice like a lawyer, but it'd be a, a big, broad question. And we would share that publicly. It would be posted online. Um, so things like the question of uh, the, how do you buy and sell bees? You're importing bees, you're bringing different species in and out, looking at uh, milk, raw milk, it's kind of a gray market. Um, so we look at these different questions all while educating ourselves and learning together. So it's sort of community oriented research. So you, you mentioned in that answer, um, uh, the term food sovereignty. Mm. So um, tell us what food sovereignty is and how it's different from food security. Yeah, so food sovereignty really arose um, in the late 90s uh, from social movements. And by social movements, I mean movements that are made up of people who are fighting for their own needs and interests. Not They're not advocates as such for an idea. So these are farmer movements uh, or what people call peasant movements, fisher folk, pastoralists, um, feminist organizations. And this was part of their resistance to the WTO and to trade. So it comes out of trade and the idea of food sovereignty, the idea of sovereignty is, at the heart of it is control. Their concern was that corporations were gaining control over the elements of the food system more than governments and more than people themselves. And the power, I, and so it comes out of the movements and then uh, academics and policymakers and intellectuals really take up this idea and explore and it's changed and evolved over time as many good ideas do. And what I've really found uh, productive about the idea is the ambiguity of the concept of sovereignty. Who is the sovereign? Traditionally, would, in political terms, we would think, well, it's the government, right? The government has that control. But this plays with the idea of, well, indigenous people, some of them have sovereignty. Communities have control. What level of government? Is it local government? Is it the state government? Is it national government? And it keeps that open and it, it turns sovereignty into a debate, into a conversation, into a live idea that's always changing. Um, and it's a very powerful idea. It's actually changed how people understand human rights and the right to food. And what I've seen in North America is uh, movements in the United States starting around, I would, about 10 years ago, we're using the language of food justice. What that meant was sort of taking ideas from racial justice and climate justice, focusing on racial inequalities, um, gender inequalities, and bringing those same ideas into the world of food. But these movements are quickly taking on the concept of sovereignty and food sovereignty in the United States. I see this really in the last three to five years. And that means two things in the US context. One, again, emphasizing that element of control, local control and, and what scale of government and community um, organization is, is the right scale. But also it signals an alliance and sort of um, solidarity with international movements and acknowledgement that all local struggles are, uh, are require that solidarity with other groups and that you can't fix your local food system unless you understand the global food system as well. So your uh, description just then helps me to understand uh, the answer to the next question, series of questions I have. So you were appointed the special rapporteur on the right to food by the United Nations Human Rights Council in May of, of 2020. Mm. So what is what is the special rapporteur? What, what, what does that person do? What's their job? Yeah, it's such a fancy sounding term, right? I mean, so the word rapporteur, it comes from reporter, right? There, there's that element. So the US, so I'll take a step back. The UN Human Rights Council is the leading United Nations body that deals with human rights. And they have a series of special rapporteurs. And what it means is I'm an independent expert. And they've, they've authorized me to be the leading independent expert on this particular mandate, which is the right to food. There are about over, there are over 40 other mandates, water, gender, racism, um, et cetera. Um, and so my mandate, they, they spell it out. So it's the governments of the world come up, come together and they say, okay, special rapporteur on the right to food. This is what we want you to do. And in my case, it's a very broad mandate. Um, and it, it, so this, the right to food allows me to think about political economy, trade, culture, uh, global politics, global politics. So it really opens things up. And, and it, it, what it does is I, now, I have certain obligations. I'm I have to write two reports a year. 
My first report, uh, I presented it, I've done, already presented it to the UN General Assembly, in theory in New York. It was just me in front of this computer. Um, and my first report was on international trade, how to change the rules of trade to align and blend more with human rights and right to food. And then I also present, uh, my second report goes to the Human Rights Council. So the body where the world governments deal with, with um, human rights writ large. But um, what it does is I have access. I, I meet with world leaders, with diplomats, with social movements, with advocates, international organizations. Um, it's, and, and people in some way are kind of required to meet with me, but they want to meet with the special rapporteur because I'm the person that sort of is the center of that conversation, of that global conversation. And part of my job is to share what I'm learning, right? To be that public a uh, learner in a way to learn in public and to, to articulate it in a way to provide a narrative, to pro provide a story of what's going on, some degree of advocacy. So part of what I do is also hold governments accountable. So I write very angry letters to a government wagging my finger. Why didn't you do this? And why is this a problem, right? And they have to answer in public. Um, so, it, it, um, there's, so there's a fact finding element, there's a public uh, education element. And each rapporteur makes the job their own. So you make it uh, your own. Part of my particular position has been unique for a couple of reasons. One, because of the pandemic, um, it's heightened the already existing hunger crisis. So hunger was on the rise before the pandemic. The pandemic made it worse. So now hunger is such an acute issue. It's made my work more um, intense for lack of a better word. Hmm? The second thing is the UN Secretary General has called for a UN Food System Summit that's going to be held in the fall in New York. And what that means is the Secretary General has asked for the world governments and policymakers and civil society actors and just everyone, really everyone, to come together and create some, some agenda to unify everyone to try and work together to fix the broken food system. So I've been involved in that, um, to, to, to advising, advising them how to make it a more human rights friendly approach. And admittedly, not everyone was convinced that human rights is a good thing. So part of my job was advocating to say human rights should be on the agenda. Then in turn, they say, okay, fine. We, you, for a year, you've been yelling at us about human rights. What's that even mean? And that creates a very constructive uh, discussion, right? We know, what's it mean in this particular instance, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So what is your role going to be at the summit, the, the uh, food system summit itself? And, you know, that's it's unclear because the politics behind it have been intense. Um, there's been over 500 organizations have organized against the summit. So there's a protest movement against it because they've argued that human rights was not on the agenda from the outset. They said, how is it that the secretary general has called for a summit but what he's done is this, his special envoy that he's designated is a pro agribusiness scientist. And they have not put human rights on the agenda from the beginning. So I'm in this interesting position where I try to hold myself accountable, not just to governments, they've given me the authority, but to social movements, to people. And so I have to hear what they're saying as well. So I have a foot in the summit, but I have a foot out of it as well. So I've been a critical voice where I meet sort of, I meet on the inside and I tell them, you, should, you know, look, people are saying this is not working. But at the same time, I maintain a critical, ambiguous distance, retaining the right to criticize them if things go wrong. So, you know, I meet regularly. I'm on what's called the integrating team. So that's the high level team that meets regularly to give this summit some coherence. Um, people ask for my advice. How do we make, you know, how do we do this and how do we do that? But then at the same time, I, I, I always tell them, look, my, my next report is going to be about the summit and I'm gonna point out what went well and what didn't work. You know, will they invite me to be a keynote speaker? Maybe, I don't know. Like I asked them the other, I'm like, what are you guys, are you guys gonna invite me? That's a question, that's a live question. Um, but I enjoy, I enjoy that ambiguous space. I enjoy being that person. This, it's, it, I don't get, so the rapporteur, it's a voluntary position. I give no resources. I have a, a staff of one full-time person and half-time person in Geneva with, and no money. So, but there's a freedom. That's what I have that other people don't have is I carry myself as if I'm free and I can ask anything and I can say anything. And, and I, and again, freedom, but with an accountability. And that's, that's the dance I try and balance. 
Well, I, I hope they do ask you to speak. I think they would benefit from hearing you speak. Um, <laughs> so, so you said one of your one of your responsibilities or one of the, the factors in this job is that it's it's um, you are an educator and you are also being educated. So you raised obviously uh, the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on the food supply and on hunger. So tell us one or two things that you've learned uh, in the in this particular context about um, food production and access to food and hunger that you want us to 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 emphasize to to be conscious of yeah i you know I, i'll maybe i'll point to something sort of dark and then something more on the light side light being sort of the hopeful uh, on the dark side i think what people in the united states and many other rich countries have have experienced is that hunger ha for the middle class that didn't realize hunger was a problem they saw it now is sort of revealed, but also many middle-class families went hungry. And I think people have appreciated how fragile and how brittle the food system is, how precarious, how it's been, and how it's been built on something that it's, it's, it's ridiculous, really. Like it's absurd that we have more food in the world than we need. There's been a, an abundance. So the problem with hunger always arises, not when there's a lack of food, on a global per capita basis, since the Second World War, we've always produced more food than we, we need. The problem of hunger is always political. So hunger is when political institutions fail. That's what I think has just been so clear in everyone's experience now. You don't need someone like me telling you that because we've all seen it or experienced it. What I have seen work is how people come together, food being that necessity, that core element, of what works is that if people can figure out how to feed themselves, we always have had to do that anyway. And, and seeing what is working is, is new elements of working together. So again, solidarity. But what I've learned specifically is understanding, so intellectually is understanding, my understanding of economics has changed. Is so economics will have its models and supply and demand and, you know, um, I don't want to caricaturize the discipline and, you know, some of my best friends are economists, right? I, I, that is a joke. Uh, of course, you know, economics is a diverse and complicated field, but, I, but what it, it has lacked is an understanding of food as an economy of care. And I think feminist economists have always been articulating that. But this understanding that before we go to our office or our job or, or open up our laptop is how many people work or uh, whatever our, our livelihood is, if we're not a food worker, hmm, you have to eat. And that is that fundamental, like that's that basis is, well, okay, how we eat is and how we share food and how we, who cooks, who produced the food, who grew the food, all those questions have to be figured out first before we figure out anything in the economy. And by understanding as an economy of care that situates food alongside with housekeeping, child care, taking care of each other as a community. And that element of, if we're not focusing on that as a priority, nothing else will work, right? Financial markets and the tech market and all of that is, depends upon all the care work that is often undervalued, invisible, underpaid and feminized. It's often uh, women. So what we see in COVID is who's taking care of most people, who's making sure we stay alive. It's usually women in this situation. So I. I, I knew that in a theoretical way, but it's just, I understand it a lot better now. So, you know, what you're talking about the intersections here between um, food production, uh, food security, food sovereignty, social justice. And, you know, one of the things that uh, was striking to me, one of the things I learned during the coronavirus around this topic is, um, you know, those kinds of injustices that run the, um, industrial food economy in the United States. In particular, I'm thinking about uh, these outbreaks of COVID in, among meatpacking plants. Exactly. So, so say a little bit about that aspect of what, you know, what the COVID impact has been on those people who, who uh, are essential in providing us food, who are um, particularly impacted by food insecurity and by the impacts of the co uh, coronavirus. Yeah, and no, I'm so glad you raised the you raised the meat packing situation. So what happened is that meat packing plants, and you know, there's only 
a small number of companies in the whole world that are the meat packers. So you see this concentration of power. That's the core problem here is that concentration of power. And so what all food workers, whether it's meat packers or in, in restaurants or farmers or laborers, all of it are, are, have been deemed essential. But what that's meant is they're forced to work, but they're not given the protections necessary to make sure that they're safe. They're treated as if they're expendable. And so what happened at the meat packing plants is they didn't provide meat packing plants. The, the, the assembly line is super fast. It's just incredibly fast. And they're, they're working shoulder to shoulder. And this is just a COVID disaster that was waiting to happen, that happened. And they so the, what they should have done is slow down the assembly line, put more space between the workers, protection uh, equipment for the workers. That costs more. It slows down production. They didn't do it. So then these meatpacking plants became centers for the outbreak they created they made covid even worse in the surrounding communities so it made workers sick now our food supply is weakened and everyone is also sick with the virus so it just that story captures the whole food the problem of the whole food system right and you see workers you know this is true everywhere where you'll have labor laws and employment laws protecting all workers and there's always an exception for food and ag workers always even child labor. So child labor is legal in the United States as long as it's your own kid on the family farm. And that, that makes me laugh. I'm like, as if families are not spaces of oppression. Like that's the quintess, that's where oppression is taught and learned, right? And you can put your kid to work and, and, and no one can say anything, right? So, so it's, it's this it's treating it as an exception. Whereas I want to flip it and say, no, food and agriculture is the basis, is the rule. It's where we should start. And, and let everything else be the exception. On injustice specifically, what's been depressing is it's been predictable. We, we knew that communities of color, black folk, uh, indigenous um, people, women were going to experience the, the virus in, in worst and that they were gonna go hungry first. And it was true and it proved to be true. These are historical trends. This has been happening for centuries now. And, and so I, but again, the flip side is what's happening is I'm seeing new relationships of solidarity. The big one being between farmers, uh, sm small farmers and workers. And something workers always tell me, they're like, you know, don't romanticize the small farmer or the peasant farmer, if you will. They're bosses, they're employers too. But the fact that around the world, the workers and the farmers are finding that alliance, this is new. This, this is where I think there's, that's where the future will lie. Well, Michael, on that hopeful note, uh, we've come to the end of our time. I have to say it's been a tremendous pleasure talking to you. We could go on talking for much, much longer. Um, as I said, I hope you are allowed to speak at the summit. I think they would benefit from hearing from you. Um, I wanna thank you so much for taking the time to, to speak with us and share about your work, about your position with the UN and about um, the food system in the United States and globally. It's been a real pleasure. It's been my pleasure, Paul, and thank you for giving me the space to reflect with sort of friends and neighbors. Thank you. I've been speaking with Professor Michael Fakhry, Associate Professor at the University of Oregon School of Law. He is the Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food for the United Nations Human Rights Council. Thanks so much for watching.